morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Man, I'm stumbling. I had a late night last night. Anyways, on this episode, I've got an update on efforts in 15 states to end enforcement of federal gun control. We know that if we support the original legal meaning of the Constitution, the number of federal gun control measures that are authorized are zero. And we've got efforts that are happening on the ground to take steps forward to bring those to an end. Now, there are two primary strategies being used. I'm going to briefly cover each of these. One is the TAC model. That's our model and approach legally. And then there's the other approach that we can call the Missouri model. And I'll cover those briefly and then point you to the bills in each state that have been filed under each so you can take action in support of those. Plus, I've got some heavy law enforcement opposition that's been coming out, well, coming out of the woodworks for some, but we've known about this kind of thing for many, many years, but they've been aggressively lobbying against this type of effort in three states so far, and we expect to have more in the near future. But first of all, before getting to all that good stuff, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. That's all spelled out. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path path to liberty. There you're going to find all the archives for over two and a half years. On individual episodes like today, I'm going to include a bunch of links for you to have more information. For example, I'm going to include links to a lot of bills. So if you live in one of the states where one of these pieces of legislation is pending, you can take action to get it to move forward because it's going to need grassroots support in order to cross the finish line in every single one of these states, no matter how popular things may be on rejecting federal gun control. You can find all the platforms run. So in case we happen to be missing from one, all of a sudden things are gone, you know where else to find us. We're not just on the mainstream platforms like Facebook and Twitch and Twitter and YouTube. We're also on a number of other video platforms like odyssey.com, which is decentralized and censorship resistant. They can't take your stuff down even if they wanted to, because it's hosted on the decentralized network of library.tv. We're also on Gab. Sometimes we're on MeWe and Minds. It depends on the file size, how long I talk. We're on Brighteon, BitChute, and elsewhere. You can also find the podcast edition, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and the rest. Again, that show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And it was a late night last night. I got to hang out with my great friend Tom Woods and his lovely partner Jenna, who were in town here in Southern California for Murray Rothbard's 95th birth birthday celebration. It was down in Orange County in San Juan Capistrano. Really cool speakeasy event. Tom gave an amazing speech. I met a ton of people who rolled up on me and were like, hey, you know, I've been watching your show or listening to it or following your work for ages. So many cool people. I appreciate everybody. So I was thinking this morning, man, I got to catch up because I've been so far behind on looking at the comments, especially on Facebook. And there's been a lot on Facebook lately, but I have not really addressed many of those lately. So I'm in the bathroom this morning and I'm on my phone looking at YouTube studio and I see a comment from a longtime listener of the show, somebody who actually blogs for the website, who was kind of pissed that uh, his comment about an episode a few days ago had gone missing. Well, I'll tell you what, that does happen from time to time. But the interesting thing is he was like, uh, basically blaming me for censoring it, which is kind of irritating. But anyways, I'm thinking, man, I better look and see what else is going on. And I wanted to just share this other comment that I found. And this one was posted on the YouTube page for this episode, which I'm broadcasting live right now. But it was posted like 45 minutes or an hour ago. I just want to read this to you so you guys get an idea of the absurdity. I posted it on my Twitter. Let's see if I can pull pull this up. If you're not following me, at Michael Bolden, it's a lot of fun. Um, I can be a little mean there sometimes. But anyways, here's what Thomas Linton had to say. Loon, amazing that you ignore not only the Constitution's supremacy clause, but the last real effort to maintain nullification, the Civil War. You are as bad as the santuary loons. If your ignorance was concretite, you'd be the interstate highway system. That's a pretty funny joke, but <laughs> it's amazing that so many people are so comfortable talking about things they know nothing about. And it's generally the people who are the most ignorant 
who are the most arrogant. So Thomas Linton, you are my comment of the week. And maybe I should start highlighting these if you <laughs> like these anyways. But I want to say hello to a few people out in the live chat and give people a few more minutes to say uh, to join us to get notifications on the live platforms. There's Clay Kent, Tyler B, Patricia Dance, Jay Rod, Grendel Hall, uh, Lawrence Smith, Justin Morrison, Dan Reed, JL Jensen, MRGF, Hodge 1958, and everyone else. Oh, there's uh, Dixie Strong from Alabama. Glad to see you. Tyler B, Patricia Dance, and everyone else. I appreciate you being here. I'm going to see if I can get a chance to look at some of the comments a little bit later. I might break up the episode in half to be able to, tr to reply to some questions because I've been so bad on the comments lady lately and keeping track of them. Anyways, let's get right to this. And I want to first point out, and I'm not going to get into a lot of a foundation on this, but I want to point out that if you want to understand the legal basis, the constitutional basis for the strategy that we use to nullify federal gun control, really in practice and effect, you have to check out this episode from last November, Second Amendment Preservation, Foundation to Nullify Federal Gun Control. And in that episode, if you haven't already learned this, this is what you're going to learn. You're going to learn what James Madison said people are supposed to do when they don't like stuff that the federal government is doing, whether they just think it's bad policy or whether they consider it unconstitutional. And he had a four-step plan in Federalist 46, which included cities, states, and individuals using a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. Then you're also going to learn about the Supreme Court legal doctrine backing James Madison's advice up. Not that Madison needs backing up, but it certainly makes it a little bit less difficult to do this kind of thing in a political climate where most politicians are totally ignorant or on the original legal meaning of the Constitution, and they think that the only thing they have to pay attention to is what the Supreme Court has to say. Well, thankfully, the Supreme Court, for over 150 years, has backed Madison's advice up in something called the anti-commandeering doctrine. I also go through briefly uh, the fact that there are five major cases that back this up from 1842 to 2018. And basically what the Supreme Court has held over and over and over and over is that oh, no matter what the federal government has to do, they generally don't strike down what the federal government has to do or consider it or take an opinion that it's unconstitutional. But what they do say is no matter what the feds do, they cannot require the states to use personnel or any other type of resources to enforce or implement a federal act or regulatory program. And then in that episode, you'll also learn briefly that the ATF, which shouldn't even exist in the first place, has an incredible Achilles heel. That is, they don't have the resources or the manpower or the person power to enforce their so-called laws, regulations, and orders that are on the books. They're gun control measures. They don't have the person power to do more than 10,000 cases per year. And without help from states and localities, their gun control is dead in the water. So anyways, let's get right to this. I want to, I told you there's basically two main strategies. I want to start out with the TAC, the 10th Amendment Center model, which we've pushed out for a number of years. And we have model legislation that I've pulled up on the screen with just a few highlights here. I will include a link to this in the show notes so you can download the PDF and you can share it with your state legislator, your state representative and state senator. It might be a little late in the legislative session here in 2021, but you stood, should still start sending this to them so they are aware that they you want them to introduce this and take action to stop or ban enforcement of federal gun control. And basically, the important part of this model legislation is in Section 3, the prohibitions. And just briefly, I'm going to highlight a couple of things here. It says no agency of the state or political subdivision of the state. Political subdivisions are basically cities, counties, towns. Those are all creatures of the state. Even in home rule states, they're still generally political subdivisions. No agency of the state, no political subdivision state or employee of an agency or political subdivision of the state acting in their official capacity shall participate in any way in the enforcement of any federal act or utilize any assets, state funds or funds allocated by the state to local entities to the enforcement or any investigation pursuant to the enforcement of any federal act, law, order, rule, or regulation regarding a firearm, firearm accessory, or ammunition if the act, law, order, rule, or regulation does not exist under the laws of the state. Well, Bolden, well, what about the state gun control laws? 
they are all bad too. But we have to think strategically. If we just run in like a raging bull and just say we're going to get rid of everything and anything all in day one, uh, maybe a hundred years in some situations, at least 80 years uh, on a lot of gun control issues, it's never going to happen. So we have to think smart. We have to think strategically. We've got the Supreme Court backing us up on this opting out. And once this type of piece of legislation passes, while it doesn't end all gun control in one fell swoop, first of all, if you think you can pull that off, I want to see it happen. You show me how that happens and let's follow your lead. But I'll tell you what, once you start getting into the trenches with these people, you learn how much how much they love this garbage on all ends of the political spectrum. The so-called Second Amendment people are generally all bad on the right to keep and bear arms. They're all for permits and permission slips and uh, common sense restrictions. And some of the gun organizations like the NRA are really responsible for most of the federal gun control that exists today. The most effective federal gun control uh, organization might be the NRA in itself. Anyways, so while it's not going to end it immediately, this again is the foundation to bring this stuff to an end. So what happens immediately? It bans state and local enforcement of any fun federal gun control measures on the books that don't have concurrent measures in the law in the state. So that what it does is it shifts focus and attention away from the rem uh, to any remaining gun control. So all of a sudden, if there is still gun control being enforced, they know it's really not the federal government. They know the problem is on the state level. And so each moving forward, if you want to get rid of something, each time you work to repeal a state level law after you pass this model legislation, then it represents a twofer in a one-two punch. Basically, once you end state level enforcement of something, you remove something from the books on the state level because you've passed a law that says you can't enforce anything federal that's not on the laws in, in the state, you have a one-two punch. And it automatically ends support for any concurrent federal gun control measure as soon as the state law repeal goes into effect. So this is a very strong foundational first step to decentralize what's going on. It clarifies that there's only one layer to deal with. You're not going to go to federal court to stop the states anymore. You just work in your states to stop the federal gun control. Then you work in your state to stop the state gun control. So we're starting to see some movement on this type of legislation, even though we've had extreme resistance to it from friendly quarters in recent years. And a piece of legislation from Representative Leo Biasucci, I'm not sure how to say that, I apologize, Leo, if I got your name wrong, in the state of Arizona, he introduced House Bill 2111. That basically just says, we're not going to enforce any gun control measure that isn't on the books in the state of Arizona. It passed out of the House already. So this has gone through two committees. It passed the first committee by a vote of seven to six, the second committee by a vote of five to three, and then it passed the full house by a vote of 31 to 29. Now you may think that Arizona is a really strong gun rights state, but it, maybe it is, but the vote is very close and things are turning a different direction there in Arizona. Probably a lot of my neighbors here in Southern California are moving there and ruining things, but uh, sorry about that. <laughs> it wasn't me sending them there at all, I promise. So 31 to 29, it's out of the House, House Bill 2111, and now it has to go through the committee process to hopefully get concurrent on the, uh, the Senate level. Now, interestingly enough, I found that the ATF has a handy little PDF document for every state in the country called State Laws and Published Ordinances. I've got this up on the screen here for Arizona, and I think that should serve as a handy little guide. So it lists everything that's on the books. Like, for example, in Arizona, it's actually required. Where is this section here? Uh, ARS 13-3101B requires compliance with the National Firearms Act. So according to what we found at NRA, ILA, and then the ATF, we, we learn that Arizona under state law is required to participate in the National Firearms Act. So banning something on a state level that ends enforcement of federal gun control that isn't on the books in Arizona, it really clarifies that the problem is that there's a requirement to enforce federal gun control on the books in Arizona. And that needs to be repealed. And those who want to get rid of the, uh, the NFA in Arizona, they know where to go instead of just begging Washington, D.C. to fix everything for them. This will help make it very clear. Now, a similar in, uh, situation is happening here in California on a different issue. 
CBD. Now, if you're going around Southern California, especially here in Los Angeles, you can find coffee shops. Now that some are kind of open, you can go to a coffee shop and get CBD, cannabis infused coffee all over the place, cannabis infused foods. But the problem is sometimes that's generally not being enforced against because it's illegal under state law, under the state, whatever the state FDA is, their copy of it here in Sacramento, they basically have a law on the books that says we have to copy in California what the FDA says is legal or illegal on additions to food. And according to the FDA, it's 100% illegal at all times to put CBD in food. Now you don't have to like that uh, CBD and food or not, but it's illegal on the federal level. So Sacramento literally just copies it. So what's happened is you've had this really nasty haphazard enforcement here in Los Angeles. They don't do anything about it. They think they have other things on their hands to deal with like gun control, maybe. And so they don't really enforce that. And you go all around town and you find this in food. But if you go to another part of the state, maybe Orange County, for example, where I was last night, there have been a lot of enforcement options or actions over the past couple of years. And people are basically getting businesses shut down. There was a real popular uh, CBD manufacturer who moved to Texas. We're hearing a lot about people moving to Texas from California because they don't like the restrictions on their life. So what are people doing? They're working to get the state law repealed that says that they have to follow federal law on this. And it's the same type of approach where you find this kind of really kind of nasty in bed relationship between the states and the feds. We have to break that chain. House Bill 2111 in Arizona is a great step forward. Should it pass into law, it's in the state Senate. So please contact, if you live in Arizona, contact your state senator and ask them to support House Bill 2111. A similar bill is in Nebraska, legislative bill LB. 188. And on February 24th, according to a report here by Mike Meharry, the Government, Military, and Veteran Affairs Committee held a hearing on the bill. According to the North Platte Telegraph, two dozen people came out live in support to testify in support of the bill, and 238 people submitted actual letters of support. That's pretty awesome because we haven't done actually any activism on the ground, organizing, urging people to do this in Nebraska yet. And we're already getting 238 people for an early committee hearing submitting support. Only one person testified in opposition, a member of Nebraskans against gun violence. But they weren't the only one who opposed. The other strong opposition to LB 188 in Nebraska came from the Nebraska State Police. They submitted their opposition in writing, citing a standard gun grabber canard that gun control protects people, claiming that passage of the bill would, quote, unquestionably raise the chances of firearms ending up in the hands of felons, the mentally ill, perpetrators of domestic violence or those prohibited by protection orders from possessing such firearms. Don't think the Nebraska State Police are on your side on the right to keep and bear arms on the Second Amendment. You may find an individual cop who is, but as an organization, they've lobbied aggressively against this. They submitted their statement saying that this uh, ending gun, federal gun control, not even taking the federal gun control off the books, but stopping Nebraska state police from participating in this and kicking the can over to the ATF. They probably realize that the ATF can't pull it off or they're probably getting all kinds of funding from the feds to participate in this kind of garbage. So that's in the government, military and veterans affair committees. And it actually needs to get a vote to move forward to the full state Senate there. So if you live in Nebraska, please call your state senator and ask them to support. There's a bunch of co-sponsors on it, but it has to get a vote out of committee to move forward. LB 188. We also have another bill using this model in West Virginia. It's Senate Bill 353 from Senator Eric Tarr, who also has 20 co-sponsors on the bill. There's uh, concurrent pieces of legislation, basically the same thing on the House side, House Bill 2739 and House Bill 2694. They are in each chamber. The Senate bill is in the Senate Judiciary Committee. The House bill is in the House Judiciary Committee. Both of these bills or all three of these bills need to get a vote in the Judiciary Committee. Please contact your state senator, state representative. You know the drill. In essence, for every one of these, if you live in the state, only if you live in the state of the bill in question, 
contact state senators, contact state representatives. And if you really want to drill down, go look up the name of the committee and contact all the committee members. Literally give them a phone call. They don't get a lot of these. Give them a phone call and say, I want you to get this bill a hearing and a vote. I want you to vote yes on Senate Bill 353, House Bill 2739, and the like. A bill in Texas takes a very similar approach. It has some exceptions for border control. House Bill 635, I don't know why um, there has to be violations of the Second Amendment or enforcement of federal gun control for the border because, I don't know, shall not be infringed doesn't say that there's any exceptions, but I would take it as a pretty good step forward in Texas if House Bill 635 move forward. Now, this is a pretty interesting one. Uh, in Utah, House Bill 76 never was originally intended to address this type of issue, but through the process, and sometimes we see this happen, usually when you go through the process where there's committee hearings, committee votes, and the like, generally they water the bill down. They You start at a high level and you were, you know, you start at your goal and you know, you're not always going to get that. So then you start at high, but not too high. If you start too high, then it doesn't go anywhere. But if you start at a pretty moderate place and you know, you want to get there, generally they'll try to chip away at that, but they rarely actually start with something down here and add to it to make it better. So house bill 76 was, uh, a, a, you know, it's a, it was about some, uh, it was a preemption for state and local in Utah. And this was moving forward in the legislative process. And somebody decided to attack on an amendment that said a rule ordinance or policy uh, under which the entity enforces or uh, short version, they banned the state from using state resources or personnel to enforce any federal gun control that's implemented or in effect on or after January 1st, 2021. So it's a line in the sand that would address any of the new stuff that we probably will start seeing coming from the current administration in the near future. Whether it's going to happen through the legislature, the Imperial Congress, or it's going to come from the Imperial Executive Branch with a pen and a phone, I don't know. But they're at least taking the stand that they can do this. What I hope will happen is once they get this passed, the people in Utah will realize that the world doesn't come to an end if Utah says, well, we're a pretty strong red state and we're opposing the blue people on the other side and the world doesn't come to an end if we stop enforcing federal gun control. Now let's expand this from January 1st, 2021 to forever. It's not just new stuff, it's all of it, because none of it should exist. So this actually passed the House uh, late last month by a vote of 56 to 16. It's House Bill 76. I'm not sure about the other stuff in the bill, but this is actually very positive, and I'd like to see this move forward, at least this possible, this part of it. Now, I'm going to take a quick look before I get in the chat, before I get to the Missouri model of this legislation. Uh, and Ben Kerman asks, can you start in a city or a county against state laws? I've done an episode on that. I don't have a link to it, but basically no. Well, yes and no. But the legal strategy that's designed to nullify federal gun control or federal programs using James Madison's advice in Federalist 46 is a state or a locality against the federal government. The legal structure of that relationship is totally opposite of how localities are related to state governments. So the strategy is much easier if you, on paper at least, to deal with the feds. It's much more difficult to nullify a state law. And we don't use the same legal strategy because the legal relationship between the local entities and those other governments is totally opposite. If I can remember that, I will try to put a link to that episode in the show notes because it's very important because I know we have to address this stuff as well. Uh, the chicken man says, brilliant, use the ATF intel against them. We generally use the uh, NRA intel on this too. They only talk about state level laws and they seem to be okay. They always ignore NFA and Gun Control Act and all that other stuff that they help pass or the Undetectable Firearms Act or the bumps. Well, I don't know if they help pass the bump stock ban, but they definitely got us the NICS system, the background checks and all that other garbage that shouldn't exist. But they're a very good resource at NRA ILA to look up state laws on the books. So we, on all of these bills, if you look, for example, at this report on the Arizona bill, we have a section, at least for the TAC model, 
talking about Arizona law. So the NRA tells us, and I put a link to that in the report so you can actually read it. They go through the state laws and then we have the ATF's research and they give you all the citations, all the different sections, all the parts of code, Title 13 Criminal Code, Chapter 9, Ch Chine, Chapter 31, Chapter 36, all of this stuff. It's really, really good information. And we absolutely want to use the information they collect against them. And we also want to use that Achilles heel of their lack of manpower and resources against them as well. Now, Liberty Revolutionary says Missouri really needs to get this passed. Let's get to that. I will take a look more at the live chat in a little bit if I get a chance. The Missouri model. Here we go. House Bill 85 was filed by a guy named Representative Jared Taylor back in December. It was pre-filed. Titled the Second Amendment Preservation Act, the legislation would ban any entity or person, including any public officer or employee of the state, and its political subdivisions from enforcing any past, present, or future, future federal acts, laws, executive orders, administrative orders, court orders, rules, regulations, statutes, or ordinances. It gives that whole list in the legislation, which I love because it's so detailed, that infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. This bill has gotten some incredibly aggressive opposition from the Missouri Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. They absolutely hate this legislation. They feel that they want to continue using federal gun control for a number of reasons, probably some of its funding. Some of it is also the unconstitutional, illegal, immoral federal uh, drug war. They're not happy with the, the state laws on drug possession or on drug illegality and they want to use a force multiplier saying, well, you've got a gun, you're gonna get an extra five years if you don't turn in your buddy. It's not like they have enough people in prison already. The US has more people in prison than pr probably anybody on earth, and we still have to have more. So, but if you're gonna do this, can't you do it without gun control? No, according to the Missouri Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Anyways, the bill includes a detailed uh, list of actions that qualify as an infringement. And it specifically says, including but not limited to. Taxes and fees on firearms, firearm accessories, or ammunition. Registration and tracking schemes. Any act forbidding possession, ownership, or use, or transfer. Any act ordering the confiscation from law-abiding citizens. And the way they define this, specifically, because I often am concerned about saying law-abiding citizens when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms, because if you're only saying law-abiding citizens are allowed to have or exercise their natural right to keep and bear arms, which is their right from their birth, no matter where on earth or in the universe they are born. This is a human right. Gun rights are human rights. We have a right to defend our home, our property, our family, our country, whatever. St. George Tucker once said, the right to self-defense is the first law of nature. So when they say law-abiding citizen, that raises a red flag in my head, and I'm not talking about red flag bills, but I'm concerned because if you can only have a firearm, a right to defend yourself, if you uh, abide by all laws, then all they have to do is pass a new law, and you can, as soon as you violate that, you lose your rights. So it's good that they actually included a definition basically saying a law-abiding citizen under this bill means someone who is not otherwise restricted under state law. So it's similar to the TAC model, but with a different legal approach. I think there's some wiggle room on this on how it might be implemented in each state, but but they also include a much more detailed list of things that they're trying to address, whereas the TAC model literally just, it doesn't even address that at all. It's literally saying, if the feds have it on the books and we don't, it's gone, we're not gonna participate, and then we have to change the enforcement or the activism strategy to get rid of all the state laws in the books. We can kind of do the same thing with the Missouri model, I think it's also very good. It's different than the approach that I would take, but I 100% support this approach. This bill, after the opposition from law enforcement, it did get an amendment that reduced how awesome it is, but they started with a very high bar. Basically, instead of, they include some penalties, some sanctions for people who violate the legislation, which we don't even have in the TAC model, no sanctions, no penalties. We wanna make it clean and straightforward and reduce the opposition, get it on the books and work step by step. But they wanna include that there because they think they can get this done. So I encourage them to keep going forward with that. But they actually reduced some of the penalties in the bill in the committee process, in the legislative process. And it because of the law enforcement opposition, there were like 30 
people from Team Red that were willing to walk out. It passed by a vote of 107 to 43, which I think is veto 103 to 43. It was veto proof, I believe. And there was a very powerful state house member that literally had a group of 30 to 35 state legislators willing to walk out. They weren't going to vote no because they can't be seen as voting no on the Second Amendment Preservation Act in Missouri, which has been years and years of work and activism in the making. But they were going to walk out and that vote would have also been down to 77 to 43 unless there was an amendment atta attached to the bill. What was that amendment? The amendment changed the penalty sanctions from against individuals individual law enforcement officers to law enforcement agencies or political subdivisions who hire or have these types of policies. I think the prohibition still is exactly the same, although they had to actually reduce this to get it forward. I think it's a great example of how law enforcement is always opposed to this stuff. The best resource, if you live in Missouri, is MO First, MissouriFirst.org, which is run by a great activist who prefers if I refer to the state as Missouri, not Missouri. So hat tip to Ron Calzone, who's doing incredible work trying to get this through, having meetings with stakeholders, with the head of the Senate and the like, trying to get the legislation passed. But what's needed more than anything is for people to call their local sheriff in Missouri, in Missouri, and tell them, support House Bill 85 as is. Get them on record, because the opposition is coming from sheriffs. Uh, organizations. So if individual sheriffs are on board with this, that's huge. And then you also want to call your state senator and say, I want you on board with House Bill 85. And we'll see how that goes. Other bills that use the Missouri model are in Wyoming. There's House Bill 124 and the companion Senate file, Senate Bill 81. These are both pending in committee. And let me see what committee. Uh, the Senate bill is in the Senate Judiciary Committee. The House bill is not yet in committee as of when I put my notes together. No, it is still not. It's got 18 Republicans and one Libertarian actually sponsoring that bill. So we've got to get that bill moving forward in Wyoming. A piece of legislation does not have a companion, which is required in Florida. But Kaylee Tuck introduced House Bill 1205, the Second Amendment Preservation Act, in Florida using the Missouri approach. Also, almost the same bill introduced in Ohio by Mike Loichek and Diane Grendel. That's House Bill 62. That bill is in... It's got 12 co-sponsors. It needs more. So you want to ask your state uh, representative in Ohio to co-sponsor House Bill 62. And it's in the state and local government committee right now. And it's got a pass out of that. There's also a bill from, um, I don't know who introduced this. It's a coalition of five. Introduced House Bill 518 in Iowa. That's in the House Public Safety Committee in Georgia. House Bill 597 and House Bill 268. Uh, neither of them are in committee. They've gone through second readers and they will get assigned to a committee soon. What I think was interesting about the, oh, and I don't have it handy here. Let me see if I can pull this up. The Senate bill takes the Missouri model and then it even gets a little bit more specific. It's specifically when it's going through that, oh, it's a tax or a registration, all these different things that we're not going to participate. But it says such federal acts, orders, laws, laws, regulations, etc., that we are not going to participate in the enforcement of includes specifically the Federal Gun Control Act of 1934, the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. I'd like them to add more, but then they go on with the Missouri list, which is the taxes, levies, fees, registering or tracking of firearms, uh, anything forbidding the ownership or possession and the like. So that's Senate Bill 250. Eight. Let me make sure I get that right. Senate Bill 268 in Georgia and House Bill 597. And a, a place that I don't expect it to move forward at all. But you know what? Start the ball rolling today because this type of stuff takes a long time. In Minnesota, House Bill 1265 or HF. 1265. I think it's House File is what they call it. Second Amendment Preservation Act introduced by six representatives. And just on Monday, we saw a bill finally introduced in North Carolina. I don't know why we haven't seen this type of legislation move forward or even attempted in North Carolina in recent years. But finally, House Bill 189 was just introduced by Keith Kidwell and 10 other co-sponsors in North Carolina. And that is in the Committee on Judiciary 3. And then it has to go to the Rules Calendar and Operation of the House. So that one has to go through two House committees before the full House can, can consider it at all. And then one other bill using this type of a model, uh, but it 
It's in Montana, where I think one of the best activists on this in the country, along with Ron Calzone, a guy named uh, Gary Marbit, who runs the Montana Shooting Sports Organization. I've learned so much from him over the years on the technicality, the legal legality, and the strategy on all kinds of stuff. And he was kind enough many years ago to give a personal kind of a stance training lesson to my lovely partner, Sarah, to help her with her. She's better than I am naturally anyways, but Gary probably helped her out as well. So House Bill 258 was introduced by Jedediah Hinkle uh, back in January. And this was going to do a pretty broad ban on past, present, and future uh, federal gun control measures. Not everything and every anything. And it gives kind of a list of stuff that they're going to deal with. Well, who opposed the bill? Surprise, surprise. The Montana Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association aggressively lobbied against this. Uh, Gary did a public post on his Facebook page for MSSA, which is the Montana Shooting Sports, or it might be Sports, I think it's Shooting Sports Association, if I'm getting that correct. And he talked about how he considers that organization to be the most aggressive gun control organization in Montana history, and that it totally does not represent it, represent the on the ground, the foot, the the employees, the Montana sheriffs that he talks to personally. But they lobby aggressively, and many state legislators, especially the ones that claim to be pro Second Amendment, they don't do anything unless you know. I talked in the beginning about how a lot of state legislators don't like doing stuff unless the Supreme Court gives them uh, permission to do so. A lot of people on the right don't like doing anything unless law enforcement lobby groups sanction it, and they work against anything and everything that restricts their ability to limit your rights. And so uh, the Montana Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association aggressively lobbied against House Bill 258 and killed the bill in the House Judiciary Committee. There's an interesting process in Montana that it doesn't necessarily just kill it, but they voted uh, against the bill by a vote of 4 to 15. Even people that I believe Gary talked to personally said, I'm fully on board with this. But soon as that organization lobbied against it, it got voted to be tabled, which generally means the bill's dead, but at least they said we're going to set it aside and we're going to work on amendments. And the only way that that lobby group of cops basically said that they were going to support the bill is if they changed it to only addressing future federal gun control, starting from January 1st going forward. Again, I think that's a positive line in the sand. And I think this is a way Jefferson talked about this type of a strategy when he wrote to James Madison the day after the Kentucky resolutions of 1798 passed. And he specifically said, look, we have to hold to the ultimate principles, but we need to push as far as events will render prudent. So what happened in Montana? They tried to push as far as they could, and then it got voted down. It would have died. So instead of letting it die, they took a smaller step forward, got it passed out of committee, and House Bill 258, which now would ban state enforcement, state or local enforcement, or participation in enforcement in most federal gun control measures that might come down the pike. I think it's an interesting line in the sand. It's a good strategy, and it passed out of the House by a vote of 66 to 33. Now, they could on the Senate side, now that it's in the Senate, they could amend it to make it stronger. And if there's enough grassroots support, maybe once it, they have to kind of get the two, I'm sorry about hitting the mic there, but they have to get the two uh, chambers to have the exact same piece of legislation sent to the governor. Sometimes using a different uh, approach on the other chamber in the Senate means you'll run out of time and the bill dies. We've seen this happen in Missouri where they've actually done this. Some state senators in Missouri have done this in previous years where they introduce a very small technical amendment knowing that it won't have time to go through the whole process in the House again for them to concur and get it to the governor. And that's actually a very strategic way of pretending to be a good person on this but really working to kill the legislation. So there's some risk to that. If you want to try to make the bill stronger, I would honestly really just look to the Montana Shooting Sports Association because they are working directly with the legislators. They know <laughs> Gary's driving back and forth to the Capitol all the time. And the amount of time he puts in, same with Calzone in Missouri, the amount of time they're putting in to get information and feedback from individual legislators, they know a lot what's going on. So I trust him to do the right thing on this. 
but maybe there's a chance. I'm just saying there is a possibility according to the process. You could make it stronger, and then you'd be forced to have a conference committee between the two chambers. If it passes out to the Senate that's stronger, then they have to appoint some people to work out a deal and maybe make it a little bit better. But maybe that's not the right process because the legislative sessions are pretty short. Anyway, so that one, House Bill 238, passed by a vote of 66 to 33. And I do want to mention that these aren't all the pieces of legislation. Uh, there's a number of them out there in some states that I think need a lot of work. There's one in South Carolina that only addresses future. I think it's House Bill 3042 from Representative Stuart Jones. It's a solid, very clean piece of legislation. But there's some in Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Oklahoma where it, the legislation just needs a lot of work. Either they're going to pass something and it'll do nothing, and actually absolutely nothing in practice, or it might be a step backwards. So I haven't had a chance to address that and work on it to improve it yet, but just want you to know that there are bills, people filing legislation and not doing a great job, maybe not understanding it. I don't blame them. Government schools have screwed us all up quite a bit, but Tennessee, there's a few other bills in South Carolina besides that Second Amendment Preservation Act from Jones, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Oklahoma. There's also a piece of legislation in Alabama House Bill 400 and House Bill 349, which is uh, similar to the South Carolina bill, they're scheduled for a hearing. They've probably already had that hearing. I think it was scheduled for like 11 or 12 today, So, or the hearing's going on right now. So I'll be keeping an eye on those and see how those play out. Anyway, so if you live in any of these states, you should know by now, as I keep mentioning, you have to make phone calls or send emails or share this information with other people. And the phone calls need to go to your state legislator and your state senator in support of this bill. Don't call if you live from out of state. They get pissed at that. And a lot of times we've seen when that happens, and I see some other organizations trying to whip up people to call uh, state representatives from all over the country. They just dig in their heels and are like, screw this. This is some dumb organization that doesn't understand strategy. Focus on your own state. Focus on moving things forward. Or if you have nothing introduced in your state, still send the model legislation, which I will link to in the show notes. Now, seeing I have gone a long time beyond the normal amount of time that I do for this episode. I'll have to come back and try to catch up on the chat. I've got another event uh, with Tom and Jenna tonight, so i probably going to be a little bit behind schedule on reading through the chat messages, but definitely over the weekend, I will do my best to catch up. I don't get to go through all the live uh, stream chat comments, uh, but if you have some feedback, please continue to leave those comments in the archive or smash the like button, get notifications. All that stuff, all those actions helps trigger the algorithm of the platform and it tells the platform to show the program to more people. And of course, if you enjoyed this information, if you learned something, if you're fired up to take a stand for the Constitution and liberty without waiting on the federal government to limit its own power, because that's never going to happen, please consider supporting the TAC with a membership. They start out as little as two bucks a month, and your financial faith is really what allows us to roll up our sleeves every single day and get this work done. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something. I really appreciate you being here, and I'll see you next time here on the path to liberty.